Welcome to the Pier Glass Poetry Panels and the beginning of Season 2. I'm your host, Stan Galloway, and today we'll be focusing on storytelling in poetry. We'll take a close look at the narrative function that poetry can offer. Our first poet today is Kirk Judd, founding member and former president of West Virginia Writers Incorporated, as well as founding member of and creative writing instructor for Allegheny Echoes, dedicated to the support and preservation of West Virginia cultural heritage arts. He's the author of three collections of poetry, Field of Vision, 1986, Tao Billy, 1996, and My People Was Music, 2014, and a co-editor of the widely acclaimed anthology, Wild Sweet Notes, 50 Years of West Virginia Poetry, 1950 to 1999. He has been featured three times on American Public Radio. He is internationally known for his performance work combining poetry with old time music and has performed poetry in Ireland and across West Virginia. Welcome, Kirk. Thank you, Stan. Um, and thanks everyone involved with the, with the Pier Glass Poetry Panels. This is the, it's a very nice thing. It's a very good thing. Uh, we're talking about narrative in poetry. Um, I think that's, that's a, a very apt subject in that, that poetry, to me, is a spoken word art. It's not what's on the page, it's what's spoken. And spoken word art is probably the oldest art form. It, uh, it precedes written language, <clears throat> excuse me, and probably music and visual art and dance and all the other art forms. Um, I think, or it's my belief, that the earliest spoken word was not only simple communication, but probably a survival tool, an essential survival mechanism. Uh, because as human beings, we had to explain who we are and what we have and where we come from and how do we live, how do we sustain. The way to make that information memorable is to tell stories about it. And so we did, and, and we still do. I think uh, oral tradition is, is very much alive. It's not just that storytelling festivals are on television and movies and Broadway shows. It's in everyone's everyday life. Um, that oral tradition, I think, is very much tied to poetry. One of the best definitions I've heard of poetry is beautiful language. And not necessarily pretty language, but beautiful in the way the words fit the idea and the way they come together. Um, so if we want to make those stories, you know, those essential stories that we tell, if we want to make those memorable <clears throat> to be handed down across generations, then we need to make them with beautiful language. It just makes sense. Uh, I come from an Appalachian cultural background. My, my folks have been in this part of the country for many years. And I think that it, uh, has enabled me to, to move easily into poetry and spoken word and that I have a natural lilt in the voice, a natural rhythm of language that's, that lends itself easily to poetry and song. Another uh, essential part of making spoken word, oral tradition, stories memorable is that it must be authentic. It, authenticity, authenticity is important. Uh, never use a voice other than your own. I've had for many years taught uh, in, in workshops and classroom settings where people have uh, said, how do I find my poetic voice? You don't. You have a voice. Use the voice you have right from a place that you know. Um, and other, uh, other questions that I've always gotten over the years are that if I write what I know from my place, how does anyone else understand that? Well, the more personal and specific detail you can put into your work, the more it becomes accessible to, to your audience. Uh, it's, the more personal it is, the more universal it is. Uh, everyone has those personal and specific details in their stories. And hearing them in your stories brings them closer to what you're saying. Um, every story is true. All of my poems are true stories. The wonderful poet Maggie Anderson has a line in one of her poems that says, 
in West Virginia, everyone tells stories. And if they have someone's real name in it, it has to be true. And that's 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 fact. Uh, it's right, really, because all all stories are true. Uh, use those actual names, actual places, actual events, or make them up, but let them be specific. It, it brings an immediacy and an accessibility to the work. And one of the reasons that is, is that the apparent stories is not always the only story. In fact, it's rarely the only story. Neil Gaiman says that fiction is the lie that tells the truth. So even if the apparent story is science fiction or fantasy, there's an underlying truth in that. Poetry works the same way. Often, or maybe always, the apparent story is just a vehicle for presenting that personal underlying truth of the poet or the author. Always look to the allegory. It's, it's almost always there. Uh, this is a personal story poem that I wrote a few years ago, hiking in the Appalachian Mountains that I've done for 45, 50 years now. Well, that's right, yeah, 55 probably years now. It's titled... Communion, barred owls under Bishop's nod. The tree knows the owls, understands their form and shape and its limbs, recognizes an absence of absence when they're there, but doesn't expect them now in this slant of over light slipping through the thinning canopy on the west side of the mountain an hour before dusk. Nevertheless, they've come moved by my movement on this abandoned hall road. They settle side by side in familiar ash, an old couple on a park bench. They turn to each other, press their foreheads together in some ritual of expression, some eloquence of owlness, a language I almost remember. One turns towards me, the other away. I simply stand in the road, aware of I'm in this conversation, but unaware of how to speak, how to join in. Slowly, I raise a hand. One continues to stare, the other turns to look. Just as slowly, I lower it, and we let them move on so as not to worry them. A little farther up the trail, I suddenly know they weren't worried, nor was the tree, nor the light, nor the mountain. They all really spoke to me in an owl moment. I heeded that small ceremony, witnessed, somehow heard, as I hear now, a slender whispered gratitude that I passed by and did not ask for more. Uh, so poems can tell personal stories or they can tell bigger stories. Uh, you can use stories that you've heard rewrite stories from other sources, combine several stories into one, or just plain steal stories. You can steal stories. Mark Twain gave us all permission to steal a um, hundred years ago when he was asked about plagiarism. Uh, there were rumors going around that, that Twain had stolen ideas and stories, and the reporter, who was a little intimidated by, by Twain, asked him, isn't it true, Mr. Clemens, that, that good writers often borrow material? Twain popped up and replied, Sir, all writers borrow material. Good writers steal. <laughs> so you're, we're all allowed to steal material now, but don't, don't plagiarize. That's not what he was talking about. Never plagiarize. Use the material in a combination. Uh, bring your story into that material in a new or a different way for the purpose of your story and your poem. Uh, you can combine st several stories, extend stories through space and time, incorporate them into new combinations or patterns of thought or speech. You can use poetic devices like imagery or metaphor to change up the details to make the story fit your scene. You can expand the narrative of the originals to tell a larger story, either apparent or underlined. Uh, and people say, well, if, if, if the story is familiar, doesn't that detract from it? And, and I always contend that familiarity um, is good. If somebody hears something that they think they've heard before or it's similar to a story they have, they'll pay attention to it. It, it brings them in a little bit. Blatant copying or obvious reuse 
for which you've gone off the stage, but it's okay to use other material to craft your own. Um, this is a poem that I wrote using different stories. Um, I used some of my family stories and some friends' family stories, and I made up a couple of stories and kind of just sort of smushed them all together. In the a line in the poem, there's a title of an old West Virginia fiddle tune. And when I'm performing this poem with a fiddler, I always ask him to play the oldest West Virginia fiddle tune he knows. And so I substitute the title of that tune into the line in the poem, which makes it a different poem just about every time that I perform it. And it also makes it more familiar to not only the fiddler, but to the audience. It seems to bring, uh, bring them in a little better. It, it works. And it's titled, Hill Sailor. He was like the wood of the mast he brought from the ship to make the floor foundation on. He saved the insulted top, the spoke shade, the Norway spruce down from the spill box. The drone of the pipe was in his blood, and he thought he'd left his sea leg jigs on the shore. But as he sailed through the forest with the thrush and the warbler, he knew the mountain remembered the dance of the sea, and his songs flew on the bowsprit of the Alleghenies. The night the cabin was finished, a skeleton stood in the doorway, cocked his bow arm, and played the lost girl. When he woke, he wiped the sweat, took down the fiddle, tried it, and never played it another way. He laughed at the bubbling limestone spring, the splash of summer, the quickened color in the sap drain leaf, and cozy in the covering snow. He seeded his jaw into the land and took it back at his pleasure. They pulled the planks from his sea chest to make his coffin played his tunes for a night and a day before they laid the fiddle in with him. And after they put him in the ground, they marked the spot with a single straight cedar to the sky, pointed like a mast on the mountain's horn. Um, poetry, poetry is so neat. Uh, it, 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 it's just this this open blank canvas that you can do anything with. It's a, it's a great art. Um, you don't have to tell a long story to tell a big story. Um, narrative and short poetry can have a great impact. You don't have to go on and on and on about a subject. You can tell a big story in a little space. Think about haiku. Haiku, the whole point of haiku is to elegantly and economically express a moment of insight into the natural world or, or into the true nature of things. That is a big story. And a haiku is a small form. Uh, and I think that, that personal stories fit very well in short poetry. But again, it has to be authentic and it has to ring true. It has to, to be a hard-hitting point. It has to be evocative so that the audience can, can bring their own emotion to the story. I, I tell my my students in workshops and classrooms to think about in the Christian Bible the shortest verse, which is Jesus wept, which is two words. But that is an extremely powerful piece of writing. Think of all of that that those two words evoke. There's an incredible story there in those two words. Uh, the last poem I'm going to read is, is a simile. It's a short form, a uh, Japanese form that's, that's structured kind of sort of like a haiku. But it's focused on human nature instead of the natural world, and it usually contains irony or satire. Um, in this particular poem, that there's, well, in all of the short story and in Japanese poems, there's much more backstory than a parent story. The title of this is Postmodern Appalachian Symbolism. No answer to my call on the floor. The drugs in the overturned cup. Thank you, Sam. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Kirk, for um, providing us uh, not only an overview but uh, some some probing into the depths of possibility that we have with storytelling in a poetic form. Um, 
And I go back to the, the barred owl poem and the sense of owlness that you tried to um, embrace uh, and to, to return uh, through, through human language uh, from that unspoken language of the owls. Uh, and, and I thought that was very moving. You, you said uh, a number of things, and one of the things I want to uh, make some comment on um, is that, uh, that there are two types of stories to tell, um, and those are stories of your own and stories of others. Um, and that's, that's a narrative device that, uh, that has been uh, extant you know, since the beginning of storytelling. Uh, and so last summer, um, in fact, a year ago about this time, I was just returning from um, a month's stay in Iceland. And in that time, um, of course, I had some of my own stories, but I also learned the stories of others. And so I want to give you uh, a poem that, it, that exemplifies uh, the story, someone else's story. And this is taken from the Edda, uh, you know, the you know, the Icelandic national volume of uh, of legend. Uh, there, there is in that uh, collection uh, a mention of uh, a woman named Gunlad. Um, her father was the keeper of the magic mead uh, from which humans derive poetry after drinking it. Um, and uh, she has very little, in fact, she has nothing to say in the story. Uh, and so here is my attempt to get her point of view on what has happened. Her father has sealed her inside a mountain with the magic mead. Um, and those of who have read the story know that um, that Odin disguises himself, uh, sneaks into where she is, and eventually steals uh, the mead, uh, betraying her. So this is a poem in several parts called Gunnod's Lament. One. Father has been strange since my hips and breasts have swelled, treating me like treasure and disease. I trust him sometimes to care for me, but I admit I'm baffled and afraid of being mountain sealed, a kind of living vault. Three kegs of magic mead to guard, perhaps, or just a pretext to secret me away from lustful, ugly, hurtful men. What kind of promise is it not to share a single taste of mead with giant man or dwarf when secret tunnels, hundred sealed and filled, stand in the way? Father carved a bed of stone and laid it deep with sheepskin, fitted me with brittle biscuits and salt meat, supplied a hundred crannied lamps to keep out loneliness. I am the only one he trusts, he said so, to secure his reputation, his prestige, now buried in this mountainside. Two. How many days or months have passed? The lamps provide no clue. I have not counted biscuits. The only hugs my body feels, I give myself. The only voice my ears can hear is mine. The only dreams my mind can find, recycle. The dripping of the spring becomes a ping of painful echo. The salt exceeds the spring's ability to quench. The lamps stir shadow creatures on the walls. I am mad, I think. Three. I never knew such joy could be. I heard the worm gnaw long before the fissure opened, and through the wimble wake my dream produced a man. To feel his hands where only mine had touched. 
to hear a voice not of the timbre of mine own, to grasp pricklings I had never dreamed in sheepskins. This is what comes of madness, pure, joyous madness, to have his company, his mind in my thoughts, his words in my ears, his body merged with mine. Four. This is what it means to die. He was no man, no dream. In my ecstasy, he told me that no man, no dwarf, no giant could have entered in my guarded secret place. My vow would not be compromised if he took three small sips from the magic mead my father charged my life upon. So I said yes. He quaffed it all. I could see suddenly he had one eye. Odin! And as I watched, he transformed to an eagle whose terrific wings spread wide and burst the mountain. I was betrayed. The stars wept in the black sky. I lay exposed in mountain rubble, waiting for paternal wrath to end my being if I'm still alive. So that was a, a poem that uh, you know, took someone else's story and transformed it into uh, you know, giving it a new voice, uh, which is something that, that Kirk had mentioned going on uh, as a possibility of narrative. Uh, I had the good fortune uh, that that poem was published at Bluing the Blade uh, last year. But also, narrative function tells our own stories. And uh, again, as Kirk pointed out with uh, watching the barred owls, uh, you, we have our, our own observations. Uh, and so here's a poem that tells my own story, um, again, from Iceland in, in a, a new landscape. It's titled, Lunch While Hiking Across Lagervafjall. High on the ridge, we find the cairn. A dozen, 15, 18, just three stones standing vertically. Some piled to my elbow, no other sign of human visitation. Wind from the snowbank farther on says, dwarfs once drank here. And I think elves, more likely than dwarfs or trolls, more sprightly, energetic, lighthearted. Frost answers, but it's not elves exactly. Some praetor human operator at work that reverses gravity, entropy stands it on its head and lets the circulation pump dizzily. We drink water, hiking bottles filled at a spring farther down the slope, eat hearthfisker, bread dried from haddock, natural, hardy. Watch moss grow, gray, green, ochre, Smell Arctic time, its purple dots behind, ahead, time sidestepped. A golden plover pipes its high C, a single piccolo eighth note imploring us to move on. So uh, there are a couple of examples then of uh, ways that uh, that you can tell your own story or tell someone else's story, um, and hopefully uh, those examples help you just a little bit. So I want to move now into uh, our next speaker, which is Anne Marie Lockhart. She is the founding editor of two evolving poetry endeavors, Vox Poetica, an online poetry salon and unbound content, 
and independent poetry press. A New Jersey native, she lives and writes two miles east of the hospital where she was born. You can read her words in a number of journals online as well as in print. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here and to see some of my friends' faces that I haven't seen in a while. It's good to be in the same poetic space with everyone. I've been thinking since he said it about Kurt. What he said was, um, you can tell a big story or a small story. And there's so much to that. Um, you know, Stan then kind of took this direction of my story or someone else's. And I think the two concepts are related. Um, my story can be a big story or a small story. Someone else's can be a big story or a small story. But they're all at heart, both of those things. They're all big stories and small stories. You know, the universality of the story grants its scope, but the um, personal experience of a story renders it both big and small, bigger in the larger sense to yourself, smaller in the greater sense. It's a weird door. It opens two ways. So um, I picked a few poems to read today that that work in that my story, someone else's big story, small story space. Um, I think they 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 illuminate the concept of narrative in a very personal uh, way. The first one that I want to read is by um, our friend Nathan Gunter, and it's called "The Woman Who Runs a Successful Restaurant." The meringue stacked high like skyscrapers, looming over coconut cream and crust. They groan with every bite, deep vocal moans as close as you can get in polite company to public sex. It makes her happy to make them happy, to ladle rich gravy over buttery potatoes, a hint of rosemary, her dear grandmother living again on their tongues, briefly resurrected by the wizardry of recipe. It makes her happy to roll out dough every morning for chicken and dumplings, to drop pork chops into Crisco, the pan staccato, the burn just so. Their faces, shiny from warmth and grease, from the conversation over a meal, the zing of coffee and pie and a cinnamon roll to go. Cheeks, fleshy walls of happiness everywhere she looks. She stops at McDonald's on the way home and doesn't turn on the kitchen light. She eats in the dark and falls asleep on the couch. It's someone else's story. And it's a small story. But it's a big story. And in that story is loneliness and history, family and friendship community and isolation, it all lives in that story in a few lines, in descriptions of food and the way we relate to it, um, both in a, in a communal sense and in a private sense, what it means to give and to receive. It's a really wonderful narrative piece. Um, doesn't rely much on imagery or code you know, the things people sometimes are a little afraid of in poetry, it's very concrete. But yet, every single descriptor in there carries a lot of weight. Um, one of the lines that I particularly love about it, to ladle rich gravy over buttery potatoes, a hint of rosemary, her dear grandmother living again on their tongues, briefly resurrected by the wizardry of recipe. Wow, we just got so much out of that line. It tells us about this woman, why she does what she does, maybe where she comes from. So I think that's harder to do in a fictional narrative that's a traditional prose format. It's easier to do here. We expect to see layering in our language in, in poetry. Um, it gives us a lot of freedom to, to put back story talked about backstory and he used a wonderful short form to really you know negative space explain something to us it does poetry allows us to play in that world um back to the concept of my story someone else's story the next poem that i'm going to read is an eye poem 
It's written by our friend Scott Price, and it's called Insanity's Invocation. And um, I want you to just think about his story or the narrator's story. It doesn't have to be the writer's story, right? The, the narrator's story here. And, and then we'll talk again about big story, small story. Sitting with today snuggled in my lap, I'm reminded of the time when my mind went away for a sabbatical from reason, leaving me stranded in a land where reason was a shade of blue I could not smell, normalcy, a taste I couldn't touch, decency and civility, two pillars stranded, standing on smoke, supporting only airy ashes. My mind took a break. The break then took my mind, and sanity took a lover and checked in for an extended stay at a seedy motel across the tracks from the nice part of town. Eventually, that changed. The break kintsugi. Perhaps I simply went for a walk, but it could have been skywriting from a bloomed former beauty. Maybe I just lay down to read or heard the words from a genie escaping something once shiny. Or, in hindsight, maybe I just made up some tale to explain what made no sense and a creation story that doesn't matter in the least. What does matter is, when the sabbatical came to an end, the final invoice was slipped under the door and could not be ignored. Its tally dug deep, deeper than the Nazca Plains or a child's plastered handprint or the chiseled, shadowed cracks on lifelong cheeks that leave no doubt the truth they contain. Your life, I was informed, did not get better just for you to enjoy. So, a personal story with a very universal message, with a very important mantra, you know, you're not in it alone, you owe somebody something. What do you owe? That's for you to figure out. Wow, it's a lot. E, we don't really get a lot of detail on, on any of it, really. You know, uh, Scott layers in some things that are very suggestive. His language really does um, a lot in terms of, um, you know, he, he uses words that really tell us something, but it isn't really necessary for us to get details of the story. It's a narrative piece that ventures into uh, terrain that's very, very unclear, uh, allowing the reader to kind of take one's own details and put them inside this story here to kind of personalize it, if you will, customize it to your own accord. This could be anyone's breakdown at any point in time. Um, it could be triggered by anything, and it could have any kind of resolution. But the piece that really smacks, the piece that really touches, is that end part, you know, where we talk about the, the point. What is the point to a recovery of any sort? You know, sure, we're all going to enjoy the other side of trauma. <laughs> That's a good thing. But while we're there, what purpose is there to that if we don't help somebody else do the same thing? It's a really weird kind of um, thought when you're carrying this poem from its beginning to that moment. And I think it comes, you know, as a little bit of a surprise. We are expecting to hear about some fallout. Instead, what we hear is a mission, you know. Um, and I think that's, that's another interesting piece of a narrative poem because it can take you, it can be a cautionary tale, it can be a, an adventure story, it could be a romance, it can be a tragedy or a comedy. But when it turns on itself and becomes something of a lesson, um, all of a sudden now we're not just spectators of it. And then you take that idea and you add to it the way that that Scott has used language to kind of, you know, give you the, the canvas, leave it open for you to fill in your details. It's, it's hard to read a story um, like this and not feel somehow a connection to it yourself. When I go back for a moment to Nathan's poem, also at the end, you know, the, there's a little payoff there, it's a little different. She stops at McDonald's on the way home and doesn't turn on the kitchen light. She eats in the dark and falls asleep on the couch. Kind of like these two stories back to back, these two poems back to back, because in a way, one is an embodiment of the other. You know, we also don't have the details in Nathan's poem. 
about what has happened in this woman's life. But we know a few things. She's living alone. She runs a restaurant. And in that space, what she's doing is some kind of a service, some kind of a mission, some kind of a call. So um, I get a ton of detail in Nathan's poem about the concrete. I get a ton of detail in Scott's poem about the metaphoric. Um, and when I read the two of them together, where they come together is in that, that space of mission and calling. And um, I think that's another thing that poetry grants us license to do. You can read a short story sometimes, and it's hard in fiction to run that line between being preachy, you know, being too, too uh, much of a morality tale, you know, when you're, when you're sending a message, when you're giving a lesson, when you're rendering somebody something to learn. It's a little different in poetry. We have a lot more freedom. Um, it, it isn't preaching, although it sometimes sounds a lot like it, but not in the hard way, sometimes in the best way. So um, kind of like, kind of like, I hope you guys like <laughs> hearing those two things side by side. Another uh, type of narrative poem, this is a prose poem. Um, it's written by Cassie Primo Steele. It worked by people that a lot of us in the room know. And, um, Cassie plays in a lot of different poetic media, but this one, prose poetry for her, um, she tends not to live in the concrete narrative space. She usually goes into a lot of inspirational, image-laden, um, you know, poetry that's a little different. Uh, this is a concrete story, which is, again, a little rare for her, but kind of like this in conjunction with the other two also, and I think you'll understand why I want to read it. Yesterday, my wife played with my mother's dog, throwing the tennis ball from the kitchen to the family room again and again, making her happy. And animals have fewer words and more love than humans until she said something is wrong with the dog. Her jaw was quivering. And I said, maybe she's had too much. And my mom said, no, she just does that. And so my wife knelt down, put the ball down, petted her and kept her distance because dogs don't always like to be hugged. It takes their power away. And she whispered, it's okay. It's okay. You can take a break. You don't have to keep going and going until you quiver. Wow, it's a small story. It's a moment in time, you know, but it's a huge story. It's a huge story. And in that story, we see an observer and we see different characters interacting with one another, human and canine, and we see a lot about their whole outlook. You know, we learn a lot about these people in this story by, by reading these 15 lines of words. Um, and in those lines, maybe each of those characters is only observed for maybe one or two. But we are, we, a lot is revealed. You know, my mom said, no, she just does that. And so my wife knelt down, put the ball down, and petted her and kept her distance. Said, it's okay, it's okay, you can take a break. You don't have to keep going and going until you quiver. It speaks to nurture. It speaks to need. It speaks to awareness. It speaks to the way we interact and what we care about in each other. Um, it's a little different than the other two in that uh, the observation here isn't very, it isn't directed at one person. It's directed at a room, it's directed at a moment, it's directed at an incident. But it is designed entirely to give us a big story. You know, it's designed to show us and to reveal the big moment that lives within each of the small moments, the big story that lives inside the small ones. Um, it's a really clever way to say things that are both flattering and perhaps not, about the people that we love. Um, it's a great way to observe nature and, and humanity and the way we interact within those spaces, which is something we also see a lot in Kirk's poems, for example. Um, it gives the dog equal importance in the story as an actor, not just an object. You know, um, So there's a lot to this story. You could do this as a fictional piece 
is a short story as a piece of microfiction. You could actually take this whole poem, really, and render it as a piece of microfiction. Um, but there's something about reading it as a poem. There is something about entering into it as a poem that, that lets you access all the different layers of meaning and share it in, in a very different type of way. Only one other point I want to make about fiction as a narrative vehicle, and that has to do with dialogue. And I'm just going to read a small section of my poem overheard at a bar in New York City just to uh, give us a little taste of that. Um, Midtown, about 6 p.m. on a quiet Thursday night. Just me, the bartender, Jim Beam, and these two suits catching up on who, what, where, why, and when. So what about him then? He died. Shit. When? Yesterday or the day before? What happened? Well, the story's a little unclear. Either a heart attack on the subway or he got mauled by a pickle. What the fuck? Barman pours another round. I'm going to stop the story there. <laughs> stop the poem right there. But all I wanted to do there was really reveal the way you can, you know, the, the poems that I read before were expository. You know, they, they lay it out from an um, unengaged narrator, either even if it's his own story, right? Unengaged narrator, not telling you in his words what happened through another conversation. This is a poem that's written almost entirely in dialogue. And it's, um, it's, a, different, it's a different vehicle for a communication. Um, it lets you see something from a few different angles. Um, in this particular poem, which you can go on the site and read, um, it, the, the whole trick to the story is in the dialogue. It's, the dialogue is a necessary vehicle. You almost couldn't tell the story without the dialogue. But um, not all narrative works that way either. But it's very important in poetry to remember that voice doesn't have to be your own or one characters, it could be the interplay of voices as well. Um, so even if you're going to use an expository format for something, even if you're going to take one person's speech, you can use dialogue in that space to really give us another, I don't know, dimension, uh, a little more depth. Sometimes it's just another angle on someone, the words that they use. Um, I don't use in my day-to-day, -day, I use an awful lot of profanity, but in my writing, I tend not to. In that particular poem, there are a few saltier words. Um, dialogue gives you the space to play with how people speak. What uh, is the language that character would use for something? Um, the same way you would in fiction, you can do that equally in poetry. Um, it doesn't necessarily work for every form. I don't know that you would want to have a character speak that way in a more formal poem. You could, but you have to have the, the rest of the structure that really work within that space. You might have to keep that in mind, you know, as you wrote it. But um, my, my broader point really here is just that don't walk away from dialogue as a tool in poetry. It's as important there as it is in any other storytelling apparatus, in particular in narrative space where you want a voice to carry a lot of the burden for you. Um, so yeah, poetry is narrative. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, I, I always delight when, even if we hear a poem that we have heard before, how we hear it differently each time, and how that uh, by asking ourselves what is narrative about these poems, we enter into them differently than if we simply opened up a book and said, here's a poem, let me read it. Um, as, we, as we've been talking, um, I'm reminded of what uh, beginning playwrights are sometimes asked, and that is, which comes first, plot or character? And uh, you know, different writers will answer differently. Um, and typically the answer becomes you can't have one without the other. But um, I wonder if, uh, if either of you can think back to a poem that started 
distinctively with one or the other, where you had a plot and you had to create characters to fill it, or whether you had a character and you had to figure out what is that character going to do. Um, do, do any, any uh, instances come to mind? Um, sure, I'll, I'll go. Um, the Hill Sailor poem that I did earlier, I had the character first, and then I had to think, what stories would this character tell? And that's when I started bringing in the plot from the various stories, from my family stories, from other stories I had heard. So I had the idea of the, of the character first, and then brought in the plot. I'm, I'm piggybacking off of what Kurt just said that overheard in a bar in New York City was characters presented themselves, and that's the poem. You know that they they appeared before me. That <laughs> was a literal thing. I was in the room when they there. They showed up and they started to talk, and so they you know they took on a life of their own inside my head and on my page. But they were there. I would add one more thing to this concept too, though. Um, for me, a lot of the driver is often kind of a combination of plot and character, meaning I, what I really respond to often is voice. And in both your poems and Kirk's poems, I have always um, really gravitated toward that the voice is really a unifier across all of your poems, even when they're different voices. You know, Stan, you do that um, embodying uh biblical characters a lot of times they're female not just in you know a lot of your poetry takes on other voices other people but that voice that you kind of draw from them there is a thread that runs through those things kirk does it too and where i find kirk's work to be particularly engaging is when he's giving voice to inanimate wrong word but what we consider to be inanimate characters in his work, landscape, um, nature, these are things that have real, concrete, very tangible voices in Kirk's work, and they're amazing to interact with. Well, yeah, thank you, Henry. And I, I will qualify as that generally I start with a sound. That That's what comes to me first. I hear something. I hear a sound, a combination of words, a combination of sounds, or, or something that that initiates a poem um, and it can lead to a character that's producing the sound or another object that may not be a, a human being character but a character of some sort or it may uh, turn into a, a beginning of a story or a plot first but I generally start with sound because I'm a spoken word guy that's that's just where it comes from and how it develops yeah, thank you, Anne Marie, for your comments as well. Um, and, and I appreciate what uh, Kirk is pointing out, and that is uh, there are many entry points into writing a poem. Uh, and by saying, no, it's not character, no, it's not plot, it's really something else, um, whether that be sound, or whether it be look on a page, there, there are a number of ways that that a poem can begin because poetry really is uh, more versatile than we often give it credit for being. Uh, I, I think that's why it's so hard to define. The, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the resistance to a prose poem, for example, you know, has been around for, uh, you know, a hundred years or maybe going back to, um, to Baudelaire uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and yet there, there is something that, uh, you know, if you translate his work as um, uh, something other than a poem, it just doesn't sound right. Uh, and so this idea that, um, that the genesis of a poem uh, can be not just one, two, three, four places, uh, but can be uh, so many different places, and that as writers... Uh, we may not identify it except in retrospect. Uh, it, it begins and then we say, oh, there's a poem in here and we start working on it 
and then we might add plot, we might add character, we might add sound, we might add, add shape or look or uh, smells or whatever it is that we, we do to a poem uh, that gives us um, that bridge between flicker and full flame uh, that we get with the final product of the poem. Are there other thoughts or questions uh, that any of you might have? I've enjoyed this mini class. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad that you were with us, Iram. Well, Iram LaRue. It was an honor to be here and to hear these voices and the back, some of the backstory. That always is helpful. So many times we join readings, of course, and we don't have a chance to hear a little bit more about where the work has come from. And so it's always refreshing to hear a little bit of that narrative as well. So thank you very much. Great Saturday afternoon activity. Very good. So glad that you could join us, Hiram. Very good. Uh, then we'll wind up uh, our panel for today. I want to thank Kirk and Anne Marie for joining us. Uh, and as always, uh, Morgan and Brittany, thank you for all your uh, technical support. Um, and also for uh, Rachel Patterson, who has joined us um, from Chicago to listen in today. We'll see you all next time with Pure Glass Poetry Panels. Have a great day.